This was years before dating apps were a thing, when we used various websites to try to match with essentially complete strangers. I was using Match.com, and very cautiously, I might add, as the whole concept was still new and I had some apprehensions about the possible dangers that were involved. I would log in once a week, just to feel like I was taking proactive steps to escape my lonely, single life without actually doing a whole lot in the way of dating. I started talking to a guy that interested me, and in retrospect, my interest was from a purely physical standpoint. I thought he looked like Jeremy Piven in one of his profile pictures, a celebrity I'd been crushing on for a decade at that point in my life. Had he not looked like Piven, I'd have never been caught up messaging him and would have never gotten involved. When we met up, I knew things wouldn't go well. First of all, he looked nothing like my crush. He looked like the character from the Diary of a Wimpy Kid series. Skinny, poofy, receding hair, timid. He catfished me pretty hard and didn't seem interested in addressing it in the slightest. His first tactic was to drown me in alcohol. We met at a restaurant and started with a round of cocktails. He insisted on shots multiple times in between our first and second rounds, which practically came at the same time because we drank them so fast. There wasn't any bread or starter food, so my stomach was on its own with all this booze. He'd gotten me drunk before our entrees even hit the table. A pair of Manhattans came to the table just as we finished eating, another treat he insisted on. By now, we'd had six or seven drinks, way more than the amount I'm used to. It got to the point that I insisted that I needed to go home, which he obliged almost too happily. In fact, this later on, as you can imagine, turned out to be a huge mistake. Never ever let these kind of people know where you live. It will come back to bite you in the ass. He parked in front of my duplex, but kept the doors locked. He was assuming we'd have sex in the car before I stumbled my drunk ass inside. I was so plastered and in such a state of disbelief, all I could do was laugh. We were going to drunkenly get it on out on the street like a couple of high schoolers. Suddenly, I realized this guy was a legitimately a loser. The whole thing from start to finish was just a plot to get laid. Again, you have to remember, this is in the days of Match.com. I was one of the many women looking for love on the internet. I admit that my interest in this guy stemmed from what I perceived as his good looks. But using a dating service just to get laid was crazy to me. What a bizarre way of scoring a hookup, like tons and tons of extra work. He didn't get it and I had to lay it out flat that I was refusing to sleep with him in the back seat. So it's a no after all that? He asked. I'm sorry, was all I could say. No, you aren't. If you're sorry, let's just do it, he said. It was all pressure, but I continued to deny him. His face turned darker and darker until he finally gave in. Fine, be a bitch, he said. What? I asked. He continued to berate me the entire time I sat there. He picked every flaw from my features and didn't just examine it, but blew it up. He made me sound like the ugliest woman he'd ever seen. It didn't stop with the physicality, though. Nothing was safe. Everything I'd shared about myself on my profile and at dinner suddenly became the weapons used against me. To say he hurt my feelings is an understatement. He brought me to tears and looked happy when he did it. It was just starting, though. I woke up the next morning to flowers on my back porch, complete with an apology note, the signature from you know who. I was stunned. What a complete whack job to take me out, attack me in the driveway, then leave me a present like we had history together. I was numb at the thought of him skulking around the outside of my house, peering in the windows, waiting for me to wake up. This went on for two months. I'd wake up at least once a week and find a pile of apology gifts sitting outside my back door. I spoke to a few close friends and family members, and they all told me the same thing. Call the police. Now, don't wait. Don't reach out to this weirdo. Just simply file a police report and get on the right side of safety. The issue is that I was so humiliated from being catfished, I simply couldn't bring myself to do it. Going to anyone meant I'd have to explain how the hell I got involved with this asshole. Almost blackout drunk in the passenger seat of his wannabe sports car. So I got creative. I fished out my old Polaroid camera down from the closet shelf, 
Next, I took the 380 North American Guardian pistol from my bedside table and set it on my pillow. I centered the eyepiece and snapped a keeper for my stalker friend. On the bottom place card I wrote, I'll use this next time you come by. I slipped the Polaroid into an envelope and left it at the back porch. It took a couple of days, but sure enough, one morning it was gone, and he never came back after that. Years later, I actually ran into that guy again, at a restaurant just down the road from where he took me. He was alone, balding, generally looked like hell. I was with my new husband, who had heard several stories about this guy. My husband stared him down until he actually paid his tab and left the bar altogether. The story takes place when dating apps were still kind of new to the social scene, mostly used for casual dating, parties, and hookups. I started using several of these apps probably due to the social pressure, plain curiosity, and also partly because I'd seen my friends have so much success. It just seemed like an innocent pastime for a single and promiscuous people. Like everyone back then, I heard the horror stories and urban legends about online dating. These went all the way back to the Craigslist days so I was familiar with the potentially bad stuff that could happen. This created a slight paranoia for me, so I kept my own precautions in a place when dealing with anyone on these apps. I have a slight fear of men in general, so I really use these apps as a buffer between myself and possibly harmful people. One day, I matched with a guy and we picked up a conversation pretty much immediately. He was cute in all of his photos and really seemed to be clicking with me. So the exchange is heated to the point that we're hanging on each other's every single word. For someone like me, I perceived it as a genuinely passionate exchange. Not sexual or anything, but just two people excited to learn about one another. He asked for my phone number, to which I agreed. Texting was still somewhat new back then as well, so exchanging numbers solely for the purpose wasn't out of the ordinary. We sent only a few messages back and forth before he asked me for my Facebook and Tumblr account. This started to creep me out because I hadn't mentioned using these social medias. It was like he knew what websites I used. I know it's dumb, but sharing my personal accounts was one of my precautions back then. I know he already had my number, but having my social media accounts would mean he could identify me, things about me, where I live, and all that other stuff you don't want to think about so I told him I wasn't comfortable sharing that information. He said that was okay because he's a spy. He already knew everything he wanted to know about me. I laughed and tried to joke with him, but he brushed it off like he wasn't kidding. I started getting knots in my stomach because this was getting weird and felt too close. I wished I wouldn't have given him my number so easily. We kept texting for a little while until he started casually mentioning personal information about me. My last name the street I lived on, the school I went to as a child. It gives me chills to think about all of the random stuff he somehow learned about me. It's easy just to talk it up to him actually being a spy, but what are the chances of that? Zero, probably, so how did he even know? He went on at length about how he was so relieved that I wasn't catfishing him, that I was an honest girl, not giving him the runaround. I got defensive. I started calling him a creep which his only response was laughter in all the capital letters. As I said before, this was when texting and dating apps wasn't really as high tech, so you couldn't like text bomb people, and that's where you'd send the same text to someone's phone dozens, maybe even hundreds of times. He'd text bomb me with these ha-has every time he sent them. I know it doesn't sound like anything, but it was chilling to receive. I was upset and scared. All I could do was get laughed at. After a while, I just stopped responding. It didn't matter, as he just continued to blow my phone up for several more hours. After a week, I finally went to my service carrier's office and filed for them to have him block his number. It seemed to work, as I never heard from him again. It also proves he wasn't a secret spy or whatever he claimed to be. He was just a techie weirdo. The whole thing was very isolating and demeaning. Don't make a habit of handing out your phone number to people. I never used these apps much, 
But there is one time that really stands out. It just happened to be from a dating app. I match with this girl who's really pretty. She's plain and seems to want a simple night out. No tattoos, no urge to party, and doesn't seem to be into drugs. All signs point to a nice, quiet night out. We agree to meet up for dinner and test the waters of conversation. It was your average Americana restaurant. A place I only went to once and probably went out of business later that summer. We take a booth in the back. This girl slides in next to me without any hesitation. Alright, kind of strange, but not the weirdest thing ever. We're having a little small talk. Getting each other's names right when I feel her fingers creep into the palm of my hand. For some reason, I like pretend I didn't notice. I mean, surely she's not trying to hold my hand 30 seconds after meeting me. As the waitress comes back to take our drink order, her fingers slide in between mine for the classic hand interlock. This is really happening. It's not the weird part though. Throughout the entire meal, she never let go of my hand. Can you squeeze harder? She asked me. What? I replied. Come on, your hands are so big, mine are so little, can you squeeze them real hard? She went on and on. I obliged because I thought she was being cute. She giggled and wrung my wrist back and forth like we were on a walk or something and not in a packed restaurant. The waitress brought the meal back and still, this girl never let go. We did our best to eat with one hand, one utensil, while she continued to ask me to squeeze her hand harder and harder. Finally, I realized she wasn't being cute. She was just being seriously strange. I saw the other tables looking at us with confused looks and I realized my conundrum. You're so strong, you could really hurt someone, she explained to me. Squeeze until I say ow, she insisted. Huh? Was all I could say back. Squeeze harder. Squeeze until you hear my bones pop, she instructed me. Okay, now I was getting kind of creeped out. It's almost like she wanted me to hurt her. Finally, I pulled my hand out of her wiry little grip. What seemed like a for sure safe date turned out to be a total lunatic. I called for the tab while she pleaded for me not to go, and it was all a joke I didn't understand. I paid the bill, walked out the front door, and never saw that lady again. I didn't even have to block her on the app because I deleted it immediately after. Sometimes, though, I can't help but wonder what she was looking for. More importantly, did she find it? I used to have a job that was adjacent to sex work. It was completely legal and it made me a decent wage and allowed for a lot of free time. Was it safe? Not really. Was it fun? probably too much. I was at a strange point in my life where danger equated excitement. Now, since I was always having this casual fun through my line of work, I used a lot of dating apps to fill some of my time. I had it in my head that work was work. These were guys that paid my bills, not anyone I'd ever consider getting involved with. I thought I'd just find a casual boyfriend through an app, not realizing this person probably wouldn't be cool with my lifestyle, just to put it plainly. I matched with the guy I was head over heels for. Without going into too much detail, he looked and talked like the guys I dreamt about. He was so tailored to my taste that I actually kept him a secret from my friends. I thought if I shared my discovery, it would tarnish it in some way, like one of my friends might steal him from underneath me before I could even meet him. In hindsight, maybe I thought it was too good to be true. It's what I call getting love bombed, the honeymoon phase. Two people seeing the most perfect versions of one another long before anything can be spoiled by who they really are. I was getting love bombed bad. I wanted to talk to this guy at all hours, so it was starting to affect my job. Finally, we caved and just made plans. No wasted time in dinner or a bar, he gave me his address and I dropped by late one night after work. It was explosive from the start, literally from the moment we met at the door. It was raw and passionate. None of the sterile structure I had at work. Like I could really let go and to succumb to whatever I wanted to do with this guy. He changed as things got heavier though. He started talking to me in a way I really didn't like. He'd talked dirty to me since we first started chatting, but this was a step beyond. It was mean and degrading and honestly a little scary. I thought you liked this, he said. I 
I didn't really know what to say. He started telling me about where I worked and what I did while I was on the clock. Suddenly, I understood that this was a setup by someone who knew me from the club. We were naked, interlocked in his bed with his hands around my throat, and in that moment, there was absolutely nothing I could do but give in and try and survive. I'm going to keep this part of the story brief, as it's a bad memory for me, horribly visceral, and a trigger for many others. The sex turned so violent that I was in and out of consciousness. The few people I've discussed it with just tell me that I passed out. When we're done, he insisted I spend the night. It was a traumatizing evening of waiting for the worst to happen. Would he beat me? Would he rape me again? I didn't know what to expect, but knew what could happen. It was scary and nauseating to be there at all. When I finally got out, I went straight to my coworkers, who were not very supportive. Half of them didn't even believe me. The other half assured me it was just a misunderstanding. A few of them even knew the guy I was talking about and promised me that he'd never do that. It was awful to escape that situation, only to find myself the villain on the outside. Next, I went to my real friends, people I knew outside my line of work. They knew what I did for a living and kind of blamed it on that, said I shouldn't have made myself available for situations like that. It was my first experience with the victim blaming in the early 2000s. That left me alone with my worst fears. I decided to go to the clinic and get tested. It was something I could do within my power that would yield pragmatic results. I didn't know what that guy did to me. Was I pregnant? Did I now have an STD? Finding out would bring me at least a little bit of peace. I went and did the testing, then lingered in the waiting room for a few of the quicker results. It was quiet and kind of cozy in there, so I didn't hesitate to nest myself amongst the fuzzy chairs, old magazines, and ratty stuffed animals. I zoned out on my phone and took a little solace in being able to hide out for a minute. That didn't last very long, however. As I looked down at my phone screen, I saw some familiar text, something an acquaintance of mine shared. It was a screenshot photo of my Tinder profile, alongside one of the texts I'd sent to a friend of mine. Somehow, the guy that abused me got a hold of those texts and made a meme out of the entire situation. I broke down right there in the lobby, silently wept to myself. There was nothing I could do, 100% out of moves. I got out of my career field not long after. The scariest part about the whole ordeal was how no one took me seriously because of my profession. I was pigeonholed in this weird, self-created hell, purely by my line of work. Don't ever let anyone tell you how things are just because of your lifestyle. All of my results came back negative. Aside from the emotional damage, nothing stuck. I fell off his radar after a few weeks and he moved on to another victim. Don't make the same mistakes that I did. Don't fall for the fake chivalry. Don't go out expecting others to pay. Don't go home with strangers. And above all else, don't trust dating apps. I met a guy on OkCupid, which was a dating site turned dating app at the time. The whole relationship was great through and through, but our last date got a little crazy. We'd been out together maybe four times, nothing too crazy, and used the app to do most of our communicating. I trusted him, but you can never be too careful with people you don't really know. I lived alone at the time, didn't want any unnecessary stress from the weird men coming around. Throughout those first four dates, I explained not so subtly that I used mushrooms a few times in the past, was a huge advocate for them. My date proceeded to lose his mind, totally jealous that I'd experienced them before. So, since we were getting along, I bragged about being an advocate. I offered to get us some shrooms for our next date. We agreed not to do anything crazy. There was a parade that weekend and I suggested that we eat a small amount then wander around to see the festivities. The first mistake I made was offering up to my house for the launch pad. He came over and we hung out for a little bit until we were both relaxed. Eating mushrooms and things of that nature hinges partly in all parties being at ease. Only after we were giggling and having a good time did I pull out the bag. He stared in silent wonder, 
It really wasn't a huge amount or anything, but he knew it was time to try them. Looking back, had I been paying attention, I would have realized that Silent Stare was a huge red flag. This guy clearly had delusional expectations of what these mushrooms would do to him. Instead of practicing any logic, I divvied out the portions of stems and caps and waited for his nerves to settle. We ate them together, one dry musty bite at a time. The parade itself didn't start for another hour or two, which was perfect. We had time to settle in and talk while the trip snuck up on us. We only ate a gram, just enough to get some afterburners going and maybe a full hallucination here and there. I was overconfident in my ability to get us around in a psychedelic state. I explained that I was going to use the bathroom before we left. I got up, did my thing, and came back to keep talking with my date for another 20 or 30 minutes. It's now close to the time we need to leave when he explains he also wants to go before we hit the street. He gets up to go, and I simply lounge on the couch until he returns. I wait 5, 10, 15 minutes. The time doesn't really register until almost 45 minutes have gone by. Whoa, now we're late for the whole thing. How did I not notice? Of course, it's the mushrooms pulsing through my bloodstream. I look down at the bag and I see that it's partially open. That's weird. I remember zip locking it tight, getting all the air out. I reach down and shake the contents to discover another couple of grams of mushrooms are gone. That's why he's taking so long. He's not using the bathroom. He's barricading himself in there. I creep across my living room with a growing sense of dread. How bad was this going to be? I briefly imagined he killed himself in there. No, no, that's crazy. Literally crazy. I reminded myself that this is all in good fun. I reach the bathroom and go to knock, but I can't. I'm tripping pretty hard at this point. and want nothing to do but keep that door closed for the rest of my life and never see the consequences. Shakily, I bring my hand up and knock and call out his name. Yeah? He calls through the door. Are you okay? I ask. Oh, yeah, yeah, he says. I forgot you were here. I shake my head. Or inside my house. How could you forget that I'm here? Can I open the door? If you can, I couldn't find it earlier, he explains. I turn the knob and proceed to step into my worst nightmare. It isn't blood or guts or anything of that sort. My date had uncapped a sharpie and wrote every thought he had on my bathroom walls for the last hour. There are Venn diagrams, bar graphs, anything you can imagine. All of it had to do with God, spirituality, and any other flavor of New Age nonsense. At that time, being a younger woman, I was renting the place I lived in. The ink all over the walls was just a guarantee that I'd lose my deposit and maybe even get evicted. Of course, in my trippy state of mind, the consequences were much worse in my head. I start to crack apart at this point, to which he didn't respond very well. We both hunkered down and weathered a pretty bad trip, going in and out the whole time. It was a horrendous experience, being essentially trapped with someone in a place that's supposed to be yours. I know this was all my idea, but I would have never suggested he dose himself an extra two grams like he knows what he's doing. He admitted to having spiritual delusions, and later helped me paint the bathroom to try to keep my deposit. We never spoke again, and I have never, ever offered a trip with another partner again. Don't do drugs, and stay off dating apps, kiddos. I used Tinder and other dating apps when I was younger and single. One day, I matched with a guy who was almost 10 years older than me, as I was only 21 at the time. Despite the age difference, which did kind of throw me off, we clicked really well. Many of our interests lined up, and even had some of the same concerts. Having so much in common with an older guy was a real confidence booster. He went on, and in just a week, he suggested we waste no time falling in love. He made it clear he wanted to sweep me off my feet, and there wasn't any sexual pressure or urgency at all. This was a genuinely nice guy who wanted to be sweet on someone. Later, he implied that we should move in together. He started making a checklist of our personal items, seeing what we had doubles of, and what we had none of. It was tedious and cute, and a great way to make small talk. 
It reminded me of the game Go Fish, except it was a dating version for adults. Lastly, he said that he would be happy to adopt my daughter. This was a huge thing for me at the time. Being young, newly single, and even newer yet, made a mother. He described all the duties and roles he'd love to fill, which hit every mark for me. This was like a dream come true. Now, this was all expressed before we'd even met. This was just seven days of talking. Looking back, it's some of the most psychotic stuff I could imagine, but I was young and courting weirdos on dating apps. Mr. Say It All didn't say a word in person. We met each other at a nice restaurant for an early dinner and just sulked for two hours. There's no other way to describe it. I tried speaking to him for a while, to which he would nod or shake his head or simply not even react. What he would do is stare at me for an eerie, uncomfortable amount of time. Deadpan, emotionless staring right into my eyes. If he moved his eyes to another feature of mine, he would deliver the same merciless stare until his eyes moved again. I've never seen anything like that in my entire life. We split the bill and I went home. We communicated through texting for another week as I struggled to let him know that I was no longer interested. He mentioned planning a second date, which forced me to finally come clean. We had a back and forth discussion for maybe an hour about essentially the same thing. We weren't going to talk or see each other anymore, to which he would say he didn't understand and then continued his gushy smothering talk. Once I finally got through to him that we were over, he actually took it surprisingly well. He didn't beg or plead for another chance or ask me to meet one last time. I actually never heard from him ever again. Despite that silence, I've never forgotten that damn stare. People talk about boring their eyes out and this is what they must be talking about. Dark, beady, unblinking. I could feel my heart thumping to a roar the longer he looked at me. Sometimes I wonder what he was thinking while he sat there with that look on his face. I met a girl on OkCupid many, many years ago. I'd gone through a devastating breakup a year prior and hadn't recovered well in the following 12 months. I got on the apps and started rooting around with no real idea of my intent. There's one thing I'd for sure like though, observing these people through their profiles and messages. You could tell some girls were absolutely wild, but then there were some who just seemed to be obviously crazy. And when I say crazy, I don't mean, whoa, she's going to regret that in the morning. I mean, clinically insane people having meltdowns in a cyber setting and matched with one of these girls. She was attractive and kind of my type short of the explosive mental unrest. We exchanged a few messages that ran from curious questions, oversharing, threats of violence, and eventual sexting. This girl is top to bottom off of a rocker. We meet up for a lunch date where I really get the scoop on her. She orders a cocktail and then tells me that she eats eight Kalanapins a day. For those of you who don't know, a Kalanapin is a benzo known for relaxing the brain. So it gets loosely prescribed to treat panic attacks and anxiety disorder. It can also be wildly addicting. Eating eight pills of these a day is like hearing Evil Knievel jump 500 buses or something. It shouldn't be possible. Like a train wreck, I couldn't bring myself to look away. Again, she was attractive to all my specific tastes. Bat shit crazy to boot. I needed this girl more than she needed me. I needed her unpredictable outbursts. I needed her over emotional manipulation. I needed to see her threaten people in public and then have a meltdown about it later. I wasn't clicking with this girl. I just liked the chaos that she created. I would actually regularly tell her that this wasn't working and had no foreseeable future. She didn't care. This girl was so certifiably crazy that she was legitimately detached from reality. After something like six weeks of regular dates, I finally broke it off. It was clear how toxic the entire relationship was, and clearly, I'd contributed to that. But it was purely from a point of spectating. This girl was going to be crazy either way, and for a short time there, I got a front row seat. I know breaking it off would be messy, just based on what I saw, but never could I have predicted just how far she'd go. We had a series of dates that ended in a fiery confrontation with waiters, bouncers, whoever the local authority was. 
Taking this girl out was starting to become a problem that could have long-term consequences. So one night, she came over, having the same expectation as usual. We'd pregame, rule around, jam to some music, and then map out whatever bars we wanted to land at. But this time, I just told her no. We were at the end of the line. I've been talking about since day one, and we wouldn't be making plans anymore. She did not take that well. In fact, she didn't take it at all. It was like she didn't even hear me. Again, to say this girl went by the beat of her own drum is an understatement. It'd be more accurate to say that she was constantly navigating a state of psychosis. She was nice enough to turn around and throw that all on me, and honestly, I probably deserved it. You don't get to take a picture of a rattlesnake without risking getting bit. That being said, it was a relatively easy storm to weather. She screamed at me, tried to coax me into a physical altercation, gave me crazy eyes and spit in my face. The general breakdown I'd seen dozens and dozens of times at this point. And like that, she was gone. She packed what few belongings she cared to take with her and slammed the door behind her so hard it cracked the glass in the window. I take it like I would any other win and count myself lucky that it ended there. But it didn't end there. I didn't use my OkCupid account for some time after dating that girl, probably just out of guilt. Either way, I received an email a week later informing me that my account had been banned and there could be a potential investigation depending on the nature of the closure of my account. I read the details over and over again, but none of it makes sense. I convince myself they must have the wrong guy and there is a mistake. That's when I start receiving Snapchat notifications, over and over, one after another. I get the app open and find out it's the girl I just dumped. Yeah, you like that? Thought you were just going to walk away? The message is read. They're all vaguely intimidating, lots of shit talking, she's putting me on full blast. What the hell are you talking about? I ask her. It all started to come together. She got my profile banned, and that's what the email was that I received earlier. She told them all kinds of crazy shit about me, enough that they forced to close my account. God knows what kind of insane, made up stuff she told them. It could have been literally anything. That's why the email from them seemed to be pointed when I read it. They were under the impression that I was using their app to abuse women. This was rapidly turning into a nightmare. She asked if I wanted to talk and make amends. I told her she was crazy and that getting involved with her was a huge mistake. She started sending me photos now and not the fun kind. The entire rest of the night I received endless pictures of different firearms, all placed in various positions alongside with various forms of ammo. I didn't even know she had access to this kind of thing, but here I am on the business end of a benzo addict crazy person, showing me their arsenal. I think eventually she fell asleep or something as the messages stopped. I went in and blocked her on all fronts, and she was distracted and deleted whatever profiles I felt weren't necessary. The last thing that she said to me was to watch my back, which I actually did for a few weeks. She knew where I lived, but we were never actually exchanging phone numbers. Fortunately, she was pretty easy to lose after I broke it off. Don't get involved with crazy people, if you do, don't do what I did and tease them. I got on the dating apps to start experimenting. I went through a crazy breakup and swore off men for good. Using an app seemed like the perfect way to break the ice and get to know someone who might understand my current situation. I also didn't know a better way to jump into the pool of lesbianism. I linked up with another girl, and she seemed really cool, super alternative, and not really someone I would get to know otherwise, but we had the same taste in music, and all kinds of other nerdy stuff. We really clicked on a surface level, which gave me the self-esteem boost that I was looking for. We went on a few dates before it ever got physical. Dating a woman was a totally different experience for me. There was never any kind of awkward sexual advances, no darting looks, nothing. It was so normal, I really started to see myself in this lifestyle. What I didn't know is there is an epidemic of fair weather lesbian women like me. I perceived myself as a rarity, but it turned out I was actually filling a stereotype. 
One night, we finally made contact and had one of the best makeout sessions of my life. Things started moving at a much faster pace after that. I took her out to dinner, then we went to a few gay bars for some karaoke. She left me to go to a chat with the boys at the bar while I sat alone at a table. They kept buying her drinks, and she got more and more drunk while I sat there sipping my beer, waiting for her to come back. Eventually, a group of college-aged girls walk in and she immediately wanders over to them. They all go back out for a cigarette. I sigh and finish off my beer. My date and one of the other girls come back in and walk toward the back of the bar or the bathrooms. They stop and start making out against the wall. Stunned. It's like I was watching us hook up for the very first time as it happened very similar to this. Spontaneous and in the back of some dingy bar. Like I said earlier, I had a traumatizing breakup with an ex-boyfriend. Watching her play with me was bringing back all of those old feelings. The self-esteem I'd been working on was now trying to suffocate me. I left but my date followed me out. She cried and begged for me not to leave, that she was drunk and just made out with strangers sometimes. I couldn't even believe what I was hearing. All of my romantic feelings were crushed right then and there, but we still hung out as friends for maybe a month or so. Part of me couldn't let go of that ego boost, that feeling of being desired. One day, she makes the moves on me. It was sloppy, random, the same kind of thing I saw when she kissed that stranger. And I could tell in the moment she really didn't have feelings for people, but rather just urges for certain things. It didn't matter who was around as long as she was satisfied. It turned out that she was the stereotype, not me. I declined, but more than that, I gave her a piece of my mind. I let her know that I wasn't interested in common girls who couldn't figure out what they wanted, and I called her a liar. She started screaming and freaking out, expecting me to console her. I didn't. I simply told her to get out of my car and never call me again. Acting like a child is the number one way to get me to close the door on you. Instead of just opening up the door and exiting like an adult, she balls up her fist and smashed my passenger window out. It was unbelievable to watch the glass and blood suddenly explode in every direction. Frankly, I was shocked that she even had the strength to do that and kind of became worried that she was about to kick my ass. She did the unthinkable. She jumped out of my car and ran into a busy intersection, then laid down in the middle of the roadway. I sped out of there so fast I didn't even bother to close the door. The speed alone bounced it closed and I never heard from her again. She wasn't on the news as a corpse in the road either, so I think she came around before anyone could actually run her over. I'm a very outgoing woman, but I'm larger than most men like, so I have a hard time making connections. That being said, I was on every dating website and app for at least five years. It was the easiest way to stay current in the dating scene without constantly striking out. Dating people you only know through the web leads to some weird encounters. One of these encounters happened when I accepted a date invite. It came from one of the shortest men I've ever seen. I have nothing against dating men that are shorter than me, but I get comfortable when they're too small because I'm 5'11 and overweight. This guy was 5'4 and maybe weighed 115 pounds. Despite the severe size gap, he seemed like a genuinely nice guy, had a lot in common with me, and even seemed to have his life together. Many guys and girls throughout online dating service don't have jobs or cars, a house, or income of any kind. So when you meet someone who has all of those things, you definitely try to keep the conversation going. Well, we go to grab drinks at a bar, He's nice, we're having a good time, but eventually, he starts making odd comments about my height and how strong I looked. I thought maybe he was just a little socially awkward, but hey, it didn't seem malicious. But he didn't stop. Every other word out of his mouth was a compliment regarding my size. It got more and more uncomfortable to the point I couldn't enjoy myself anymore. And in a weird backwards way, I understood what girls meant when they complained about being objectified. It's like you aren't a person at all. Toward the end of the date, he ends up telling me that he has a fetish around being picked up, lifted, and squeezed by larger women than him. 
He says there's nothing else that satisfies him, and it's been this way for many years. Oh. Okay, well, some people have their thing, and at least I could kind of see what he was attracted to me physically for. So I agreed to a second date. Well, leading up to all of his messages, it started being about how he couldn't wait for me to lift him up in my big, strong arms, and how he wondered if I could lift him up over my head. Eventually, that was the only focus, and I'll admit I got weirded out and politely told him I was no longer interested in him. He took it surprisingly well for someone so forward. I was partly expecting the classic clingy, you're the only one for me kind of behavior. I judged him way too soon, as he turned out to be somewhat of a classy guy, just a little shameless with his fetish. But that wasn't the weirdest. The worst? I matched with a guy on OkCupid, but we never actually got a chance to meet. There was never any mention of a date. We briefly talk, and then he kind of fell off by the wayside for a few months. One day, he reappears in my message requests, apologizes for being absent, and explains that he was on another date with an OK Cupid member for quite a while. No worries, that's what the service is for. He explains further that he and the other girl have broken up, but are still talking from time to time. Okay, splendid. Where do I fall into all of this? Between the two of them, there was very little chemistry, but apparently the sex was really good. They wanted to know if I'd be interested in a threesome to help elevate their bedroom play. It was creepy, disparaging, and it got me off of dating services for quite some time. I had a happy ending though. My long-term partner and I met on OkCupid and I couldn't be happier. You just have to weed through the wrong ones and the weirdos until you find the right one to fit. I had an OkCupid account for a few years, and I would occasionally get on there, mostly when I got drunk, and message people or check to see if I had any matches. One day, this cute girl messaged me. We really hit it off. It was just the usual get to know you kind of stuff, like, what do you do for a living? What are your hobbies? I told her that I worked night shift at a local Walmart, and at the time, I didn't see giving her this kind of information would backfire in any way, but boy, was I wrong. We continued messaging for a few days, getting to know one another. She was a school teacher and a bit older than me, all of which seemed cool to me at the time. Being that I had a minimum wage job though, I didn't really see much of a future between us. Our conversations were growing a bit stale, so being the asshole I am, I decided the best course of action would be just stop talking to her completely instead of telling her that I wasn't interested. Whoops. A few days go by. She messages me a few times, but again, being an asshole, I didn't reply. I kind of remember it feeling good to be so sure in my actions. In my head, it was simple. Ghost this chick and she would disappear in no time. She didn't disappear, however. The messages turned outright hostile, asking me why I wasn't talking to her, why I didn't want to be her friend. It was a brick wall, though. Nothing coaxed a response out of me. I moved on and tried talking to other girls. No shame in my game. A few more days go by when one night about 2 a.m., a co-worker comes up to me and says some girl was asking for me. At the time, I didn't put two and two together, so I just shrugged it off. Then, the following few nights at work, my co-workers keep coming up to me, telling me this girl is coming and looking for me. I finally remember that I told this girl where I worked. People reported her in the parking lot for weeks wandering from door to door around the building, going in and out. Someone is stalking the entire property after sundown. It was only a matter of time before she caught me somewhere around the store. The next night she found me. She came in with a guy and confronted me about ignoring her messages on OkCupid. She wasn't being hostile when she asked, so I told her that I'd been busy and hadn't been on in a while. So awkwardly, she said, Well, okay, just message me when you get home. At this point, I was a bit freaked out, but I stuck to my ways. I did not message her, hoping that she would just leave me alone. Of course, this only made things worse. She started showing up looking for me on my days off, continuing to ask my coworkers what my schedule was, and even for my home address. The next time I saw her was there around 3 a.m., again with this random guy that was different than the last one, asking me why I still did not message her. 
This time she was way more aggressive, saying, what kind of person does this to someone? And bad things happen to those kind of people. I doubled down and told her the same thing again. I've been busy and hadn't gone on the website in a while. And then as always, I continued to ignore her. After a few times of hearing that she'd shown up looking for me again, and me being afraid of getting stabbed to death by this crazy chick in the parking lot, it did finally stop. She stopped coming to my work and stopped messaging me. In the end, all my hard work and perseverance paid off. She moved on to stalking someone new. It took six weeks total, but all I had to do was absolutely nothing to make her realize it was over. More of the story, ignore your problems and they will eventually disappear. My story isn't anything horrific, but goes down infamously as the worst date of my life. It all started on OkCupid. We matched, exchanged a few messages, and then planned a little coffee meetup. He was cute, he was nice, and lived in my area. At the time, I didn't think these guys existed at all. Still, there was a lot of crazy stuff happening with online dating. I tried to just be careful in all of my meetups. The coffee was a hit. We turned out to have a lot in common enjoying the same music and movies, and even frequented a couple of the same bars. It was still early in the day, so we decided to go across town for a drink or two. He followed me back to my apartment, which I still regret to this day. Never let a stranger know where you sleep at night. From my apartment, I rode with him to the bar. Everything was going fine up until we ordered our second round. That's when he decided we were already becoming more than friends. Started putting his hands on me. It was funny at first, but then he grabbed me around the back of my neck, and it honestly was the scariest thing ever. There was no reason for any of it, and it just totally set a different vibe. After the second round of drinks came, there wasn't any longer any space between us. He's drowning me with how close he is. Then he had the audacity to have me pay for the second round. I was shocked, absolutely beside myself. Was this his game? Did his routine ever work in getting him laid? I excused myself and went to the bathroom, just to get out from underneath him. I paid for the drinks, which meant we had a clear tab. If I wanted to run, now would be the time. The issue was that I remembered he knows where I live now. If I disappear right now, this guy 100% is going to come looking for me. He will eventually find me at my apartment. I called one of my guy friends and asked him for some advice. He was giving me pointers on how to direct the conversation to get home safely. He even offered to come pick me up. While I'm having that conversation, one of my girlfriends texts me and asks how the date is going. I'm not very techy, so I waited to respond to her until I was finished with my phone call. After hanging up, I open up my girlfriend's message and respond with, This date is torture. I'm in hell with this guy. I'm trying to figure out how to get out. I toss my phone on my purse and put on my best smile to return to the table. I come back and he's staring bullets at me. The text I thought I sent to my friend actually went straight to this asshole. I wish I could have seen my own face because in that moment, I had a realization. Sure, I'd majorly f***ed up and totally embarrassed myself. That was unavoidable, but I'd also created a situation that ended the date. There's nowhere to go but home. He didn't crack though. He embraced the drama and started a whole pity party about how he wasn't a good date. I begged him to just leave me there that I'd get myself home. He refused. This was his way of making up for being some kind of weirdo by making me suffer even more. For 30 minutes, I sat next to him in his car, staring out the window, awkwardly apologizing every few minutes. When we get back to my apartment, get this, he still tries to kiss me. He even waited for me to get inside my house before leaving, just to make sure I was safe. The craziest part was getting a phone call from him the next day. He wanted to know if I'd go on a second date with him. It was crazy back then to see how many people in the dating pool were totally unaware of themselves, myself included. Definitely makes for a lot of crazy stories though. <laughs> 